Let's talk about supplements that you really don't want to waste your money on. First up is vitamin E. Now, you see vitamin E advertised all over the place. It's in every grocery store. It's in every drug store. And vitamin E is really important. That's true. The problem is most of the vitamin E that's available for purchase is the wrong form of vitamin E. There was a very, very famous study years ago that really put the nail in the coffin on vitamin E. They took a bunch of smokers who are full of what's called oxidative stress. And oxidative stress from smoking is really one of the main reasons that smoking is so bad for you. Well, vitamin E is considered an antioxidant. Now, that sounds like a good idea if you have oxidative stress, if you're oxidizing things all the time. Now, the way to think about oxidation, if that doesn't sound familiar, rust is iron that oxidizes. And so that rusty thing on your rusty old nail, that's the oxidation of iron. So an anti oxidant would prevent that oxidation. Sounds really like a good idea. Vitamin E is an antioxidant. So, good idea. Let's give smokers vitamin E. And that'll prevent all the problems with oxidative stress for smoking. Oops, when they did that and followed smokers, lo and behold, they found that the smokers who were taking vitamin E actually developed more lung cancers than the smokers who weren't taking vitamin E. And for years, it was thought that vitamin E was the problem. Well, vitamin E is an antioxidant, but when it combines with oxygen, it becomes a pro-oxidant. Now, the good news is, if you have vitamin C in your system, vitamin C then takes vitamin E that's oxidized and reverses that so that it becomes an antioxidant again. But if you don't have vitamin C in your system, then the oxidized vitamin E becomes a pro-oxidant and causes the problem. Why is that important? Because at that time of the study, it wasn't realized that smokers are profoundly deficient in vitamin C because we're one of the few animals that don't make our own vitamin C. So it's not that vitamin E causes cancer, and you still see this on the internet. It was vitamin E and smokers that perpetuated cancer because they didn't have any vitamin C. But back to vitamin E. Most that are available are not the right kind. There's actually a number of different forms of vitamin E. There are tocotrienols and tocotrienols. And each of them have a specific job. And it's beyond the scope of today's lecture to tell you each job. Eh, I'll tell you one. There's delta forms and gamma forms that may actually be very effective in suppressing cancer cell growth. But that's not in the vitamin E that you're taking from the drugstore. If you're actually going to take a vitamin E that has any utility, you want to get a mixed vitamin E that says mixed tocopherols and mixed tocotrienols. But having said that, there is evidence that those mixtures may not allow the really good guys to shine. So, long story short, there's far better supplements that you can spend your money on than vitamin E. Second, calcium. First of all, there is no human need to take supplemental calcium in a tablet or supplemental form. The problem with most of these calcium supplements is they are not taken to your bone, which is the reason you're actually taking them. You have to have adequate levels of vitamin D to deliver calcium to your bones. On top of that, you really need adequate levels of vitamin called vitamin K2 to assist vitamin D 
in taking calcium to your bones. So you could swallow all the calcium that you want, but if you're not having adequate levels of vitamin D, and quite frankly, 80% of my patients in Southern California, when they first visit me, are vitamin D deficient, and fascinatingly, a great number of these people come to me with osteopenia or osteoporosis, which is low bone matrix, low calcium in their bones, they're all taking their calcium supplements, but none of them are taking an adequate amount of vitamin D. There's far better ways to deliver calcium to your bones. Number one, you got to get your vitamin D up. Bare minimum is 5,000 international units a day. The University of California, San Diego, which has one of the biggest vitamin D research units in the country, thinks the average American should take 9,600 international units of vitamin D3 a day. That's basically 10,000 international units a day. In fact, that's what my wife takes. That's what I take. That's what I have most of my patients on. They and I have never seen vitamin D toxicity up to 40,000 international units a day. Never seen it. Both Quest and the Cleveland Heart Lab recommend that a normal vitamin D3 level is anywhere up to 150 nanograms per milliliter. And just this week, almost on a weekly basis, I saw a patient with a vitamin D3 level of 60 nanograms per milliliter, whose well-meaning healthcare professional provider told them that they were vitamin D toxic. No such thing at that level. In fact, if you read any of my recent books, that vitamin D level of 60 is much too low to be effective. Now, where do you get vitamin K2? Well, I prefer the supplemental form, but vitamin K1 and vitamin K2 are present in green leafy vegetables. And as you know, I'm a vegetable leafy green predator, and I personally think that purpose of salads is to get olive oil and vinegar into your mouth, but it's a great way of getting vitamin K into your diet. Another great way is eating small fish, whether it's anchovies, whether it's sardines, whether it's mullet. I just got back from Italy and every other day I was served a plate of anchovies or sardines or mullet. And guess what? You eat the whole thing, head and all, bones and all. And it's a great source of bioavailable calcium. In fact, a little town south of Naples in the south of Italy called Acciaroli, which I visited, this town has more people over the age of 100 per population of any place in the world. About 30% of this village are centenarians over 100 years of age. And what's fascinating about these people is that they are fishermen and they eat anchovies throughout the day, supplemented with a lot of olive oil and a lot of rosemary, but that's another subject. So get these small fish in you and they're delicious and easy to do. Finally, if you've been told you have osteopenia or osteoporosis, the cause, as you learned in Gut Check, is not your exercise program, is not whether you're getting enough calcium, but the cause is actually LPSs from leaky gut. And there's study after study showing that it's the little pieces of shit coming through the leaky gut that's causing the osteoporosis. You seal the leaky gut by following the Plant Paradox program, and we've resolved osteopenia and osteoporosis in our patients who we've documented that they no longer have leaky gut. So all the calcium in the world is not going to do the job that you think it's going to do. In fact, there's some scary evidence, and I don't want to really scare you, that these forms of calcium 
rather than going to your bone, can be causing calcification of coronary arteries. But that's a whole nother subject. In other words, don't waste your money on calcium supplements, please. How about B12 and folate? As you've read in my books, about 50% of human beings carry one or more mutations of what are called the MTHFR genes. Now that's a mouthful. I tell my patients the way to remember it is they are the mother effer genes. Because if you said MTHFR out loud, we bleep you from network television. They are associated with a lot of interesting abnormalities. And a lot of people who are told they have the mother effer genes are told that that's why they're anxious, that's why they're depressed, that's why they're suicidal, that's why they smoke, that's why they're addicted to alcohol, that's why they have suicide tendencies. And it is true that these do associate in families. However, there's an easy way around this, and we can't spend our lives blaming our mother effort genes for everything that bad happened to us. First of all, what this means is that these genes normally make you make enzymes that attach a methyl group to vitamin B12 and to folic acid and turn them into their active vitamin forms, which are called methyl B12 or methyl folate. And you may see methylcobalamin as methyl B12. That's all well and good. Those are the active forms. If you carry these mutations, you could swallow all the regular B12, all the folic acid in the world. You could eat rich B12 foods, rich folate foods like green leafy vegetables, and you'll never make the active forms because you don't have the enzymes to do it. The great news is you can take methylated B vitamins, methyl B12 and methyl folate. But here's the catch. Many of us to absorb vitamin B12, well, we have to have a receptor in the lower part of our intestines called intrinsic factor. And intrinsic factor basically opens the door, grabs B12 and puts it into your bloodstream. If you don't have intrinsic factor, you will not absorb even the right form of B12 and it won't get into your bloodstream. Now, sadly, a number of people don't have intrinsic factor. And in long ago, it was called pernicious anemia and people got B12 shots. Well, here's the great news. You can take methyl B12 and methyl folate as a sublingual tablet and let it dissolve under your tongue. It will go directly into your bloodstream. Do not pass go, do not need intrinsic factor. And the problem is salt. How do I know how effective it is? Years ago, one of my patients with the mother effer mutations, I put him on sublingual methyl B12 and methyl folate in a tasty little lozenge. And he came back and we measure B12 levels and folate levels in all of our patients. His B12 levels and folates were still lousy. And a consequence of that, another chemical in his blood called homocysteine was still elevated. And I said, you're not taking your B12 and folate. He says, oh, yes, I am every day religiously. I said, no, you're not. And he says, yes, I am. And I said, and you're putting it under your tongue, right? He says, and his eyes lit up. He said, well, well no, uh, it's so sweet that I sweeten my coffee with it. And I said, well, you can't do that because you're swallowing it. I said, do me, humor me. Just put it under your tongue. I'll see you in three months. And sure enough, once he started putting it under his tongue, his B12 levels became normal, his folate levels became normal, and his homocysteine dropped to normal. So that's the importance of getting the right form of methyl B12 and methylfolate and taking it the correct way. So if you're just swallowing B vitamins, looking for B12 and folic acid, I got news for you. It's not gonna do half of you any good. 
Now, while we're on the subject of B vitamins, my good friend Dave Asprey just published a reel about the dangers of vitamin B6. Now, while it's true that high doses of vitamin B6 have been associated with neuropathy, and I have actually seen one patient for the first time who was on very high dose of vitamin B6 with neuropathy. And when we took away his vitamin B6, that neuropathy cleared. However, it's like anything else. The active form of vitamin B6 is called pyridoxal 5-phosphate. That's a long one. It's abbreviated P5P. That's a lot easier. Sometimes you'll see it as PLP. It's the same stuff. If you're looking for the right forms of B vitamins, make sure you're looking for the active form. And good news, a lot of companies make a sublingual tablet with methyl B12, methylfolate, and P5P. And if you see that, that's the one you're looking for, and you don't have to worry about vitamin B6 toxicity. Finally, what should you not waste your money on, but what you should spend your money on in terms of vitamin C? And I just got a question about this on my social media. Somebody wrote in and said, Dr. Gundry, I know you're a big fan of vitamin C, timed release. What do you think about liposomal vitamin C? So liposomal vitamin C, like many other forms of liposomal supplements, are more readily absorbed than regular vitamin C. And so, yes, you will absorb more ascorbic acid in a liposomal form than in a regular form. But quite frankly, that's not the point of taking vitamin C. If you follow me, you know that vitamin C is one of the few vitamins that we do not manufacture. Almost all other animals manufacture a continuous supply of vitamin C. There are actually five genes that make enzymes to take glucose, yes, sugar, and convert it to vitamin C. We have all of those five genes, but the fifth gene in the chain of making enzymes is what's called a ghost gene. In us, it's inactive. It's also inactive in guinea pigs and New World monkeys. Fun fact. The problem, we think, is making vitamin C is expensive because it's taking glucose that your brain might like instead. And if you had a lot of vitamin C in your diet from all the fruits and vegetables that we were eating in the jungle, then it would be silly to waste some of that energy in making vitamin C that we were acquiring from the diet. And we think that that's why it became a turned off gene. So what? Well, vitamin C is essential to repair the cracks in collagen that occur in our blood vessels and also in our skin. In fact, you may have noticed that smokers have lots of wrinkles. Getting back to where we started, smokers, because of oxidative stress, use up all of their vitamin C. And they don't have any vitamin C available to repair the cracks in collagen that sunlight causes. And that's why they have a lot of wrinkles. The same thing we learned in blood vessels. Your blood vessels are constantly flexing. And collagen is kind of the rebar in blood vessels. And when it flexes, it breaks. Now, normally, vitamin C repairs that rebar, puts it back together, repairs the collagen. If you don't have a continuous supply of vitamin C, those cracks appear. And quite frankly, we try to patch those cracks with cholesterol and a plaque. And that's why in smokers, we saw that most of the disease in coronary arteries in smokers was where the bends were. And that is why vitamin C is so essential. 
How essential is it? Research in rats. We can genetically en engineer a rat to have a ghost gene as that fifth gene, just like humans. And those rats live only half as long as a rat that makes its own vitamin C. Now, here's the good news. If you put vitamin C in those rats drinking water so that they're drinking vitamin C throughout the day and night, they live as long as the rats that make their own vitamin C. In fact, the late Bill Sardi, who's a researcher in vitamin C, showed if you look at that benefit, then if humans were taking continuous vitamin C, they would have the potential to live, based on rat studies, about 250 years. Sounds fun. So what a hack to just take time to release vitamin C. So that's why, yeah, you could take liposomal vitamin C, you could swallow vitamin C, but what you want is a continuous dose. You can either take 500 milligrams four times a day, there's a lot of chewable tablets available, or just buy time to release vitamin C. I personally take 1,000 milligrams twice a day. Vitamin C is that important, but an acute dose of vitamin C, sadly, vitamin C is a water-soluble vitamin. And that vitamin C, after you take it, is gone in about four hours. So you have to continuously resupply it. And that's why timed release vitamin C is where you want to spend your money. Now, how about joint supplements? Now, joint supplements are not useless, but they're incredibly misunderstood. There are a number of joint supplements who have been shown in placebo-controlled trials to actually benefit. You may have seen my product called Mighty Flex, which uses a compound that was discovered in a particular breed of cucumber in a placebo-controlled trial in humans, improved joint mobility, improved joint comfort, and improved joint health. So that's just one example. Many times you go to Costco or another big box store and see glucosamine, and chondroitin sulfate, and MNM. These also, in placebo-controlled trials, work. But here's the really interesting thing that I wrote about in The Plant Paradox. Those compounds work because they bind lectins in your GI tract. And so, as many of you know, lectins and leaky gut are the real underlying cause of arthritis. So these compounds work not by getting in your joints, but they work by absorbing lectins that you eat. So just when you see a study saying, oh, there was no evidence that MSM or glucosamine sulfate gets into the joint, who cares? They're working in your gut and your leaky gut and the lectins were actually the cause of your joint discomfort. So that's the mechanism of action. So you always want to look at where are these compounds working. And I'm a big fan of these joint supplements, as long as you understand that they're not, this particular group isn't working in your joints, they're working in your gut. More amazing episodes just like this one, watch now. Number one is carbon-15 or C-15. Carbon-15 is a recently discovered essential fatty acid that quite frankly no one even knew existed or how important was until work with dolphin pods that the Navy keeps. 